What's up, guys? Welcome into episode 96 of the Miss Call Podcast. I'm Cub Wood here with Sa Sartori, and we are here with special guests from Stanford University, Jenna Gray with an A, not an E. Jenna, how are we doing? I'm good. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. I mean, we're really excited to have you on, too. I literally, when looking up your accomplishments in volleyball, I had to scroll on my laptop to see all of the things that you've done at Stanford University. Um, and I had to do similar things uh, when it came to your accomplishments in Javelin as well. So very excited to have you on. A, a tremendous athlete, first and foremost. But uh, we also hear that you are quite the prankster. So we are so, so excited to have you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yep. <laughs> so we'll start. Um, we'll start here. So during one of the more recent national championship runs, you were given a hotel room by yourself. Now, to a lot of people, that's awesome news. Like you get, you just get to kind of uh, be, obviously be by yourself, decompress from a long day without anybody else being there. But you don't like being alone. No, I was saying that like it was the worst like what I think it was like two or three days I was like pacing in the room like at first it was sick like I had two beds like one room myself like I had an eating bed and then a sleeping bed um and I was like it was sick like and then like an hour in I was like oh, I'm kind of lonely like and then I, for some reason I was so stubborn though like I wouldn't go to someone else's room um but yeah by the end of the weekend i also like convinced myself that the hotel was haunted and like it was an older place <laughs> like i was just like panicking um so yeah usually it's like seen only seniors get their own room um okay. on the road so like i waited four years for it and then despised it so i told my coaches <laughs> after that i was like whatever you do do not let that happen again like i was so destructive got no work done was like freaking myself out like I'm not here for it. So, so hold on an hour in an hour in you had decided what bed was your eating bed and what bed was your <laughs> sleeping bed. And then an hour later, you were like, I don't like this setup anymore. Yeah. So the bed closest <laughs> to the door was the eating bed for me to get my crumbs and everything in. Um, and then the bed furthest from, from the door, you know, the safer bed. Um, was the sleeping bed safer bed there's mm -hmm. no there's no one else in that room just her but it's the safer bed no problem it was haunted <laughs> oh i i was literally checking every time i went into the room i would like check the shower check the closet and i would check the curtains like i was checking the entire room it was like freaking me out so you don't like being scared so did you ever like have a haunted house growing up did you ever see ghosts <laughs> <laughs> in my house, I had a ghost. Nine. So we had, like, um, in my house, I shared a bathroom with my brother. And, like, I, I figured out later on that it was just, like, probably air pressure. And if you – I think it was if you closed, like, my brother's bedroom door fast enough, then my bathroom door would close. <laughs> so my brother and sister, I'm the youngest, they would, like, close the door and do that to me. And, like, I'm in my room and I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> And they convinced me that, so we built our house. So they couldn't tell me that, um, that our house is haunted by like the people who lived here before, but we would like, we have woods and like rocks and we found an arrowhead. So they convinced me that our house was built on an ancient Indian burial ground <laughs> and that they're haunting us. So yes, I, <laughs> I thought that my house was haunted for a while. That's hilarious. Now, the reason that I bring up the you don't like being alone uh, uh, fact is to ask you, what have you been doing to stay sane during the quarantine? Well, I've been super lucky that I was for about a month after um, I left campus. I was actually staying with two of my teammates um, and in their house. I think there was like eight of us. So not lonely at all there. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, this last week, I uh, went down to Texas, and I spent the week with my boyfriend, so again, not lonely. And now I'm one day in. But at least my parents are here. I have my cats, so I'm not as lonely. My parents probably want to kill me because, like, I just get bored and go and bother them. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I'm not completely by myself. Well, I, th there you go. You found a way to be around <laughs> as many people as possible. Now, you have five cats, right? Yes. Okay. How, what were you? Did you like Tiger King, or did you saw when you saw that title pop up? Were you like, "Damn it, I'm in"? 
I got so <laughs> many texts about it. And like, sometimes I get stubborn if everyone's watching something and I'm like, me too. I don't want to watch it. Um, and then I finally gave in and I loved it and like thought it was sick for probably like the first, what, like half, two thirds. Um, and then it, I, I just hated all the characters by the end. I feel like you always need one person you're rooting for. And like all of them, I was like, oh, you guys kind of suck. And they would, and then the videos of the tigers, like, oh my gosh, at first I was like, I kind of want to pet like a little cub like they're really cute yeah um and then like after seeing all the adult tigers like in that tiny cage i was like all right never mind i'm not down for this <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, i and and it was it was one of those things that a lot of people have said this but you didn't know you needed it until you needed it thanks for calling yeah. you're welcome cub <laughs> how about the music though that is catchy as hell his music the music yes in tiger king Yes. His song? Guess, did you get to that? Oh, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I thought you were talking about the background music. Yes, his music, I was like listening and I wanted to make fun of it, but I was like... It's catchy. Oh, good. I was like, it's a little catchy. Kind of and, like, kind of has a good voice. I was like, all right. That's not him, though. Yeah. <laughs> That's not actually... No. Uh, well, that makes sense. I was like, it doesn't... But there are some people where like their voice doesn't, their singing voice doesn't really match them. And I was like, oh, I guess he's one of those guys. Like, hmm. I saw a tiger deserves a Grammy. That's factual. Uh, absolutely. I, mean, I can't honestly. argue with it. I can't argue with it. It's so damn catchy. I play it once a day. <laughs> so you're also from a very sporty family. Uh, your dad played basketball at Kansas. Your mom ran, ran track at K-State. And your older sister, Rachel, actually played volleyball at Virginia. Uh, and I'll throw this one in there, too, because I was doing very advanced metric research. I, I believe your cousin Riley was drafted fourth overall in the 2016 MLB draft, which is cool. Um, has your family put together any sort of crazy competitions? I guess it's been hard since you just got home. Uh, but uh, I, the reason I ask this is that I saw a family who had put together like an Olympics at their house. Um <sighs> And it was like these crazy competitions for quarantine. I guess maybe I'll, I, I will um, change the question a little bit. What was the competition like in the house growing up? Oh, my gosh. I always tell people that, like, it makes so much sense. now. like, I'm the youngest um, out of all my cousins, like, my whole entire family, and which meant that I was always, whenever we played a game, like, probably the first one to cry. And, like, I tried my hardest to not be the first one to cry. Yeah. Um, but we used to play dodgeball. That was, like, our big thing. And what? Riley, my cousin, he throws, I want to say, like, 104. Damn. Um, so That's I grew up just getting. He's got a hose. Yes. Like, railed by older kids and then just nailed by Riley. And, like, I was, like, trying so hard. And, the, all, like, the other thing, too, is, like, if you get hit, you get hit in the face, you don't touch it. So I was like, it all makes sense now why I had such a hard time with those rules because I was being <laughs> pelted by a professional now baseball player. Um, yeah. But yeah, we, it, it was so competitive. Like my sister also came back after college and she would come in and scrimmage at um, my high school uh, while I was still playing. So we'd be across the net from each other and like it, it would almost get uncomfortable for everyone else involved because like we would actually be like snapping at each other and what we're like really? seven years apart. And then we got in a really big fight. Um, cause I offered like, we'd really good, like Otis Spunkmeyer cookies, um, at my school. And I offered <laughs> people on my team, like three cookies if they could hit my sister in the face. And then she found out and like, yeah, so sometimes it gets ugly, but like, it definitely was, it was very fun. It was nice having a lot of people to play very competitive games with. That's awesome. So, Jenna, the 2019 AVC, uh, I can't even say it, AVCA Awards, you announced that you're going to be going to the Olympics for track and field. What's that been like since the Olympics got postponed? Yeah, I guess it's been, <laughs> it's been really interesting and now a little bit messier um, trying to figure out my plan with, track and field um before it was kind of just like perfect timing um because at least with volleyball like especially for a setter I'm too young and I don't have enough experience to go to the Olympics for volleyball um so I was like talking with my agent like coaches and everyone 
and they were like, yeah, it's like, this is actually probably perfect timing for you to kind of like take a bit of a break from volleyball and then really put in time into track. So the plan was I was still practicing volleyball like a couple times a week, but I was mainly focusing on track. And I think NCAAs were going to be early June. And then I would have about, I, it was hard with graduation too, but I would have about like half a month then. Um, and the trials would be at the end of June. Okay. And now it's kind of, it's difficult because, um, I'm going to be hopefully, um, if everything works out with coronavirus going over in the fall to play volleyball overseas. And I won't get back until around April, which gives me like a two month window to just try to, Mm -hmm. Um, kind of pull it back together and I mean I guess as of now like a lot of I mean every athlete no matter what sport is kind of in the same boat with a training where you're just like trying to scrap together whatever Um, but yeah so trying to figure that out maybe talking with my coaches in because they have really good javelin in Germany and just seeing if I can on the weekends or something just like do something super super light just to keep my hand on it um But yeah, right now it gets a lot messier for track. So as of now, I'm retired, um, but we'll see. I thought I was retired after high school. So we've come out of retirement a couple of times. Well, it's, it's affected so much. So it, it's, it's, it's crazy to hear your story. And one of the things that, you know, continually that we've, that we've been talking about on the podcast is the way that uh, the, the coronavirus has affected athletes and it, it's, we all have this shared experience, but each person that we talk to has this unique interaction with the coronavirus, and yours is is no different in being so unique that you were going to go to the Olympic trials for javelin, and that's kind of been derailed, which is terrible. Now, I want to bring up the fact real quick that while at the same time you're a three-time national champion in volleyball, uh, you're a Honda Sport Award winner, which is the, the nation's best women's volleyball player uh, for 2019. You also hold the the number two record in Stanford for a javelin throw at 87 feet, 11 inches, which is like a long way. That's a big throw. Um, do you think you can make it in the wilderness? Like if you did a show with Bear Grylls, do you think you could spear chuck like elk and stuff like that? Um, I think I've definitely gotten, I think before like freshman year, um, I could just like, Honestly, I just have a shoulder. I, I really have bad form when it comes to javelin. I I guess it makes sense also, like with my cousin, like there's something we have we have shoulders on us. Um, Congrats! But I've gotten I think I've gotten a lot better at at target practice now because whenever we're bored, we'll like toss like a towel out or like a water bottle and we'll try to hit it. Or sometimes we'll toss it in the air and like try to hit it. There's been a couple times where like you'll throw it and then it's like flying and a bird will just start going. And you're like, Oh my God. You're like, Oh my God. I need to do that. You're like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. God." And like, part of you wants to see it happen. But then you're also like, I don't, I don't want to kill a bird. Just like, you know, and I also don't want to have to like clean my jab and stuff. Um, (laughs) I'm pretty, I feel pretty confident that I could, I could put some sauce on it and yeah, I think I could, I could at least pierce a couple animals. Yeah. Jenna, so I, <laughs> I threw in track in high school and my favorite part about throwing was the grunt. Do you ever over exaggerate the grunt? Like I would just I've, stop my lungs. Oh my gosh. We would try so hard. So like the funny thing was that I got into javelin um junior year I was just kind of like bored in the spring um so I tried to join the softball team but they were like no you're gonna miss too much for volleyball so I was like ah shoot I was like I don't want to do track like I hate running I don't want to do that I was like I don't want to jump I'm just I'm lazy like (laughs) and I feel like I like started throwing jab almost as like like ironically because like it's so funny to be a thrower and like we would show up to meets and like eat taquitos like a minute before we threw (laughs) and like just have like disgusting snacks like literally right before we ate um but yeah we implemented uh, they were terrible throws but we would I was never bold enough to do it in college but yeah in high school we would try to do on our last throw a big grunt um and then we would get a squad of us and we would golf clap like afterwards 
Um, but in college, not as much. We'll do it at practice, but it's just, it's so hard to get a, a big grunt and have it be, it just like, it has to feel right, you know, and you can't force it. And I never really hit that point where I could let out a big one. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought up food because now I have to ask, did you have a pre-meat, like traditional meal? Cause like when I threw, it was McDonald's breakfast. If it was an early morning meal. <laughs> And I, I used to be a big boy, so this this used to be 65 pounds more than what you see. So this was a big boy that used to smack before the meat. So I would actually, in high school, it's it's so ridiculous. My mom would run to Quick Trip before meets because, like, what, we'd have to hop on the bus, like, straight after class. So I'd text my mom and be like, hey, can you run a Quick Trip? And I would eat two of the, like, spicy chicken taquitos, Doritos. And then it was maybe beef jerky and then a Gatorade. Um, and then in college, I felt like I, I, I don't know, in college, I like was like, oh, I can't, I feel like I can't be as much of an idiot. Um, I also in high school used to do my pre-throw rituals. I would just do a cartwheel before. And then like, it, it was always so stupid. Like I just did so much of it, like ironically. So then I get to college and I was like, oh shoot. Like I, I really need to take this like, Seriously. So at least for college, we still go, we go mega protein. Like what will we like chicken, black beans, whenever I'm in Oregon, we get like a huge pancake thing and, and bacon. Um, but like the biggest thing is I just drink so much caffeine before I throw, like, I feel like you have to have like a little bit of just like, we always say like, you gotta be borderline out of control. So like, I'll drink like a bunch of tea and coffee I've had Red Bulls before. I had a five hour energy before. Like you need to be like shaking when you step on the runway. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did, what would you do after throwing? Because the whole meat still has to go on. You guys are usually done right away. So what would you do for the rest of the two and a half, three hours that you have to spare? We would normally, I guess you're supposed to like go and watch everyone else. Um, but we were a little bit salty in high school. Cause like, we at least in college you threw in the infield so like people would watch us so we we go and like cheer people on um but in high school like we would always be outside of the track and like none of the sprinters no one ever came out to watch us so we were like nah we're like i'm not going in there so we would like lay under the bleachers and then i'd have my mom bring snacks also for us <laughs> afterwards <laughs> we would lay under the bleachers and we would just like screw around and and eat snacks so would your mom never watch you throw because she was too busy going to get food or she was just always <laughs> running back and forth yeah, she, 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 like how'd you do it? i don't know <laughs> she was I, i'll say it, she was such a trooper because like in high school like you could never predict the meats were run so poorly like you could never predict when you're actually gonna throw um so i'd like guesstimate and give her a time but yeah she would run before and get me my pre-meat and post-meat snacks and then, like, do all of that. Like, what a thing, actually, now thinking about it. Getting me all these snacks. Snacks for my teammates to watch me throw for, like, 20 minutes, maybe. Like, six throws. Like, run, like, 100 steps total. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I can I can kind of sympathize with that because my, my younger brother for forever has wrestled. And if you've ever been to a wrestling meet, you show up and it's an all-day affair. They go yeah. through weight brackets from 89 pounds all the way up to 250 pounds. And you wait around and then maybe you get to wrestle two or three times and it's 10 minutes. So you oh, show up yeah. for eight or nine hours and you get to see maybe a half hour of action that you actually <laughs> care about. Yeah, so. it was really hard too because like they wouldn't – like in high school they just you didn't you don't even know like you didn't have meat sheets you didn't know who was going to show up so like some meets there was like five throwers and then some meets there was like 30 and you were like oh oh my god you're like great <laughs> <laughs> who was your mom at stanford then like who was this the go-to hey can you get me this snack that snack or wait it was d1 college you probably just had them all over oh it was it was it was still my mom she would go oh, and really? like she came out again, like number one fan this year. She made it to all of my games, like home and away, mm -hmm. except for one. But we had our, we also have um, before matches, we have like a little snack table and our trainer, he like before games, he's hilarious. He made a little Instagram page for himself too. We call him snack man. 
Um, he like makes PB and J's for us. Like we have all of these snacks like prepped and ready for us to go. So at least my mom got a little bit of a of a break in college because they they did a good job of supplying us with food. <laughs> With my experience, I've found that the PB&J is a staple to the NCAA athlete uh, diet. If you don't have PB&J, something's wrong. Oh, absolutely. I feel like it's, <laughs> it's magic before games. It's just, you got to have the right, I like, I personally like a little more peanut butter than I do jelly. Okay, I'll but take. Yes. Crunchy or creamy? Um, I haven't had, I used to be, I used to only have crunchy. And oh. then I feel like I got like shamed into creamy into having oh. yeah creamy like no one ever makes sandwiches like with crunchy so like i feel like my hand was just forced into being a a creamy girl but i yeah i feel like i should go back and just try the crunchies again yes do not go to that creamy side it's the worst <laughs> that's very true so i want to go back to the uh the a avca all american awards uh that cub mentioned a few minutes ago the on stage interview woman how awkward was that? <laughs> so, so I'll just fill everybody in real quick. Uh, you were brought on stage because you were uh, you were uh, an All American for for 2019, and they were presenting you with your award. And the lady who I guess is the MC for the event, she got real close to you. Now you don't like being touched or being close to, so she says out loud, "Oh, you're the one that doesn't like to be touched, are you?" <laughs> and on stage in front of however many people you go yeah no i i don't like being touched <laughs> at all <laughs> could you could, could you talk about that i guess <laughs> yeah i was like well it was already hard like i was so nervous like there's so many people there and i feel like it's also so scary like there's just it, it's so much scary going up and talking i can talk in front of adults all day but like talking in front of people your age so it's like there's like a hundred plus um like other college volleyball players there. So it's like your peers and you're like, oh shoot, I want to seem cool like in front of them. Um, so like, I'm already sweating. I had to walk up stairs and heels. So like, I'm I'm like trying to keep it together. And then she like gets really, really close to me. And I was like- Back away, get away. <laughs> so I stepped away and yeah. And then she called me out. And like, I, I used to be such an awkward kid. So like, I've learned the number one way to deal with awkward is you just call it out. It's like so yeah. much less awkward if you're like, that was awkward. Yeah, I don't like that. Like, <laughs> so I just called it out. And like, I feel like going off of how I used to be a super awkward kid. Like, I'm, I've gotten so much better about being like comfortable being like touched, but like, I was so weird about being hugged. Like, I didn't know okay. like, like one arm over, like two arms over, like one arm hug, like oh, two like, arms under. Yeah. Like, I just, yeah. I, I was so awkward. I overthought so many different things. So, like, it was it, so many things in one. And I was like, I can't. I was like, I got to get out. <laughs> Even your roommate backed out, too. Because I looked at hers. I was like, I want to see what she does. And she's like, uh, yeah, I'm the same way as Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So it was actually. And, like, I think the host, she was like, oh, you were the one last year that also backed away. And it actually wasn't me the year before. It was Morgan, my roommate, um, who, okay. like, it. She was pretty funny. Like throughout the whole entire like interview, she was just slowly creeping back. Like what? I at least like she just like came in hot on me, so I was like, okay. Um, but yeah, I think honestly, then I started watching everyone, and I was like, everyone's kind of leaning back a little bit. Like no one wants to be talked that close. Um, right. but yeah, we always. I latch. I know she does a lot of. Um, she commentates for a lot of the games, like on the Pac-12 too, and like. Super cool, really awesome, but she always just like takes it to the next level at um at the All American Banquet. <laughs> you just gotta know you gotta know where the where the line is and not <laughs> cross the line. Um now it's interesting you bring up your it, well, it's interesting that your roommate Morgan was brought up. Um you two have a, a very close bond. Uh, but one of the things that goes on a lot on the volleyball team itself is pranks. I'm curious to know, have you ever had a prank that went a little too far? Um, yes, we, it wasn't actually me. I feel like I'm pretty good at knowing the line, like, especially cause I, I learned the line early on. I guess I'll okay. say that. Like I crossed it nonstop with my sister and like in high school, always crossed it. Um, but we got in a prank war my sophomore year with the freshman. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and like we've been and the thing is like i get so like that's all i can think about then when i'm in a prank war is like yeah what they're gonna do to me and then what i can do to counter that um so we've been hitting them hard and then finally they like they wanted to do one last prank and then call a truce and i was like that's okay whatever like i'm ready to be done and they put like hundreds it, it's like kind of funny they put hundreds of maxi pads like stuck them to my car your car seems to be the center of a lot of pranks yes <laughs> yes i feel it? like it's it's a Oh, it's literally just a Honda Civic. Like, I don't know. I think it's because, so like at Stanford, what we're in the dorms all four years. So like, it's a lot harder to break in or like, you know what I mean? Like do stuff. Cause like you have to get inside and then into the room. Um, so my car was usually, yeah, the target. I, <laughs> I would get like really sporadic then with my schedule though. And I would park far away and like make people work for it if they want to prank my car. That's funny. Um, but yeah, so they found it and they put like hundreds of maxi pads, like took the wrappers off and stuck them to my car. And I like saw it and I was like, oh yeah, that's pretty funny. Um, and they're like, okay, like they're being really nice. They're like, okay, we'll help you take it off. And we start pulling it off and it was hot outside and the oh, no. like the sticky part came off yeah. and it was stuck to my car. And I was like, oh. How'd you get it like, out? That, that one I don't like. We had to, like, go through and, like, kind of, like, scrape the, like, yeah. stickiness. Like, you know when you have, like, a name tag and you pull it off your shirt and it leaves it on your shirt? It was that but all over my car. And I was yeah. like, <sighs> like... So I've worked, at, I've worked at a car wash for many years. Um, and that's something that people will come in with. And we have to take, like, it's like a razor blade. You have to take a razor blade. Yeah. To, like, yeah. Uh, and take it off that way, which is, it's not fun. It's not fun to say the, the very least. Um, so we've talked about how decorated you are as, as a collegiate athlete. Is there anything you're upset you didn't win? Ooh. Any, like literally um, anything. Like in college like, or in general? It, 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 literally anything. It could be whatever you think. Like, is there one thing um, you think back on, even if you were a kid where you're like, man, I wish I would have won that. <laughs> yes. We, my best friend and I. <laughs> we joined um in middle school a ping pong tournament and we made it to the semifinals uh -huh. and our team was shake and bake like I, we literally had our parents make us like shake and bake t-shirts we had sweatbands like on our wrists on our heads like yeah we tried so hard like we put in <laughs> so much effort like we were at, like practicing um and yeah we made it to the semifinals um but unfortunately we're we're taken down, but that's probably just digs in, digs a knife in, you know, it hurts. We had the passion. It just yeah. it wasn't our year, you yeah. know, and it was eighth grade. So we, we couldn't go back and do it. We had to go to high school. We had to move on. It was the last dance. Yeah. <laughs> the last dance. <laughs> so who was Ricky Bobby? I was. Okay. Just making sure. Just making yeah. sure. Absolutely. So, Jenna, this is a very special episode, not only because you're here, but this is the first time we're about to do this reading since we're sponsored. We're oh, yeah, here. we got a sponsor, and now we get to do an ad read, which is phenomenal. So <laughs> We have an ad read. So this would be the See Us Movement question that's coming. The See Us Movement, if you're not aware, the See Us Movement is a movement that spreads awareness about female athletes being underrepresented, sexualized, and judged on appearance rather than ability. So the question, if you put in promo code Miss Call, you get 10% off a purchase. That would be the ad read. Courtney, that's I not, that's not the question. He said the question. question. <laughs> but Courtney, I think I hope I did this right. That would be our partner in crime. And the question is, have you ever been judged on appearance rather than ability as an athlete? Yeah, I feel like playing I, I guess doing track and field and volleyball, and I'm sure it's kind of the same for a lot of sports, but for volleyball, like it, it just happens because you're in spandex and, and like, it, you can't really do much about it. Like people always ask, they're like, Oh, you choose to wear spandex. I'm like, no, you can't wear shorts. Cause when you dive, they ride up and like, it's just not like, um, but yeah. So like at games, it's kind of hard when you have to back up. Like I need a lot of space to serve. And sometimes the end line, there's like courtside um, seats. So like I'll oh, yeah. have to back up my butt's in a stranger's face. And you're like, uh, you're like, we both know what's going on. I'm sorry. Like, I'm just trying to play. 
Um, but yeah, there's been times where fans will yell stuff. I've been like been tagged and stuff on Instagram by like creepy, like 30, 40 year old men, like taking oh, no. pictures of me from behind. Um, but then, yeah, I also feel like for, for track and field, it's also just so interesting because it, it's so much harder to make a living off of track and field. Um, like with volleyball, you sign with the team, you have your salary and then you can get endorsements. But with track, it's like you, you're kind of on your own dime. You're trying to just win prize money um, and get endorsements. And as a thrower, especially like not many people really want throwers and that's mostly because your body type doesn't necessarily fit what people want to see so a lot of times like sprinters and jumpers get endorsements because they tend to be more lean um and have like six packs and all of that so I think that's such an interesting thing that I really hadn't realized or noticed before that like they're there are athletes that are like so highly decorated, um, but they're a thrower. Like they do a different event and don't have the looks that everyone really cares about. Um, and then there are people who aren't nearly as good, not even like Olympic level, um, but they're super pretty, super hot. And like, they have just a bunch of endorsements and stuff and are living so much easier than the people that are actually um, trying to make a living off of track and field. No, I, I want to thank you for for sh for sharing that kind of stuff because I know yeah. it's not always very easy to to talk about that so openly. So first of all, thank you for that. And I also think that it's interesting you bring up uh, the discrepancy between track and field, right? Uh, so the the track runners, you're right. I think you're right on with it that the the track runners definitely get a lot more publicity, especially when it comes to Olympic events and even when we're just talking about uh, school programs. I feel like the the runners get a lot more notoriety than do the throwers, which which is which is crazy to me because it does take a tremendous amount of athleticism and skill and sometimes just natural born skill to be able to talk like like you threw a javelin. 187 feet almost 188 feet and that's that's no joke and being able to to do the the shot put and all that stuff there, there's so much skill and ability that goes into it that does that doesn't get discussed enough yeah i feel like it's it, it is really crazy like i didn't understand how frustrated field athletes were until like i experienced it or like my biggest thing too is like i'm not trying to make a living off of track and field but my mom like or my friends try to watch me throw, like, at, at, even at NCAAs um, or, like, Pac-12. And even TV coverage, they will, like, cut um, to field events maybe for a hot second. Um, <laughs> or they'll only show recaps and just throw the winning throw Or show, yeah, show the winning thrower. So it's, um, it is really interesting that even just, like, on TV, like, they don't really value um, field events. Yeah, because I, I, I remember that. They do just go right to a little clip, and then I'm like, oh, here's the throwing, and then it's just that one, and now someone else is running now. So why don't they – like, the throwing's the best part. <laughs> I think I think so, too. I it's honestly think so, too. Oh, yeah, I, I, I did it, so, but still. Yeah, I feel like it's one of those things that, like, I have a hard time now because I'm like, I have – once you know more about something, like, you just obviously appreciate it more, and you, you get the small nuances, but I'm like – Oh my God, like throwing events are sick. Like people are throwing like hammer. Like it's yeah. so hard. It's so heavy. It's literally a massive, like heavy ball on a chain. Like yeah. people are throwing spears. People are just throwing heavy stuff. Like I, I, I'm, it's also partially, I'm just like a destructive person. Like I like to throw things, like do that. And I'm like, yeah. that is sick. I'm like, I would so much rather watch that. And then you get the grunt. You get the grunt. They're such good grunts. Oh man. I like, while I never got to pull off my grunt. There were I could talk for so long. We always talk about it. There's like there have been girls that like there's a pre grunt, so like there will be people standing on the runway and they like like blood curdling scream before they even start their approach, and we're all like, oh my god. And then you have the like the mid throw grunt, which like I feel like that's the most common. And then the most elite grunt is the mid air grunt, and it's it's already up there. But people they yell again, and you're like. <gasps> You're like, they're just encouraging it. Yeah, like you, we said that the trajectory of the jab, like it's going and it's about to go downwards and then they grunt and then just like bump back up. Like if you <laughs> they scare it into going back up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. I'm That's not going weird. down. I'm not going down. <laughs> 
before we move on uh, from from this answer and this question, I do want to point out too that even though we're we're talking about the discrepancy between uh, male and female athletes, I also think it points out an interesting dichotomy in the fact that you know you have athletes like basketball players, baseball players, football players, right? That they have a, a real shot if they go pro to make a lot of money versus if you are a skilled athlete, you are a skilled athlete. And I think that there should be better avenues for volleyball players or throwers or softball players or whomever to go to the next level and make just as much money as, you know, even a even a rookie in any of those those major sporting leagues. So I think I think it's interesting that you point that out too. Athletes unlimited. Athletes Unlimited. They're trying to get volleyball, I'm pretty sure. They're trying to get all of yeah. them. Yeah, so I was just about to say, they're trying um, – yeah, because they're starting with softball, right? And then they're yep. moving to volleyball. Um, I'm so interested to see how that goes because I know there's been attempts before. Um, it, it was a while ago um, to bring, like, pro volleyball into the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I think it is so crazy that there are so many sports that – and especially like volleyball like I, i'm i can't think of any other sport where women's volleyball is at, or like the women's sport is more popular than men so like i'm lucky that in college um women's volleyball is way more popular than men um but then it's insane that like no one plays men's volleyball no one really like shows a lot of interest in it in the u.s but it's huge overseas um so yeah i would like to see a lot more leagues in the u.s for sports like that that are so big and you can have a career um in different countries well and it's not like volleyball is some sort of niche sport where it's like curling like you're not gonna make a professional curling league even though there are so much so many skilled curlers out there right you're not gonna necessarily do that because the viewership might not be there but like volleyball is a real sport and there are young girls who dedicate their entire entire childhoods and teenage years to becoming elite volleyball players like yourself and it's in, it's it's kind of troubling that there isn't that next level for all of that hard work to kind of surmount to so uh it i, I think it's interesting that, that you bring all that up and i love having these conversations because sports sometimes are more than just x's and o's and ones and twos like it, it's there's more to it mm-hmm. um so we kind of want to get back on a, on a more fun, lighthearted side. Um, Stanford is a, well, it's a school filled with tremendous minds, but it's also a school that's kind of zany and, and kind of out there in a lot of ways. Elon Musk went there and I think Elon Musk is the perfect person to kind of um, exemplify what Stanford is, you know, very smart, but kind of an out there guy. Uh, we're curious to know, what is your favorite Stanford tradition? Ooh. Um, I think my favorite Stanford tradition is uh, at the end of every quarter, it's called Nomad. Um, and what is that the scream, right? Uh uh-uh. uh, never mind, never mind. Man. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> they started like on, I think they started by the freshman dorms. Um, but I, I don't even know, it might be one of the frats that started. They get a shopping cart, they fill it with like beers, speakers, and everyone dresses up like you'll wear like, you can wear rally gear, like you wear crazy stuff and everyone's celebrating being done with finals. And you just like drink and weave your way through campus. And then you finally end up at, it's called Termin Fountain. Um, and it's like probably like two, three feet deep. Um, and yeah, we end up then at Termin Fountain. And I feel like it's always my favorite, probably also my favorite because you're relieving a lot of stress at the end of finals because you're like, done with the quarter um yeah. but yeah i think that's super awesome so have you ever gone to full moon at the full moon at the quad <laughs> yes i went i went my freshman year yeah that's what it's for though right it's like a it's like a freshman thing yeah it's mostly for freshmen i feel like if you're if you're participating not as a freshman it's a little creepy um <laughs> yeah i guess for for the people who don't know what it is it's just like you you go, you pick up a rose, and then um, you're just like on main quad. There's music playing, and people can just come up to you, and they can ask if you want a kiss. And then you can either say yes or no, and then you like give them your rose. And then it's 
it's gotten really interesting over the years though because like obviously with consent like so much of it and also well i guess with coronavirus like <laughs> mono yeah. like and all of that like being spread yeah. um they have a new system where like you have glow sticks and it's either i think it's like like a stoplight system where it's like green means like yeah i'm here like i want to kiss people um yellow's like eh, like am i and then red is like nope just here to like, i'm just vibing watch i'm just vibing <laughs> um but yeah so then we always make for our freshmen a big thing is like making bingo cards and you like have like a set of goals and you're like like kiss someone shorter than you and like someone <laughs> was like kiss an ra and like no one's pulled that off because like it's literally against school rules um and but probably like the best but like worst part of it is there's a, I don't know if they're a club I don't know if they're a house but there's like a nudist like group and they will like just they'll wear body paint and they'll just be there and like they'll be squeezing through and be like oh, oh excuse me excuse me and like oh oh they pull out the the midwestern oh, oh. Geez, oh let me just squeeze you past you <laughs> I'm like oh like freshman year, I was like Oh my gosh. Um, oh, but yeah, it's definitely like a, it's a rite of passage. Like you have to, you have to go, don't necessarily have to participate, but it is funny watching other people. And like, again, there's very eccentric people. So it is a fun um, thing to do. So it's just it people like sucking face in the quad. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. It sounds like a that's great pretty much it. Yeah, that's literally it. <laughs> so, while we're doing your research, I found out that your band is also very different. They don't have any dress codes, whatever. They decorate their stuff, their instruments, I should say. Um, have you ever come across the girl who plays the stop sign? <laughs> I haven't, actually. There's someone who just plays the stop sign. She plays just, they just <laughs> bang on the stop sign the whole time. See, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even, like, question that because... Is man you, I don't know if you look it up, like our our band has their own Wikipedia page of all of their controversies. Um, and they got in really big trouble in the Rose Bowl, what, um, the, the year before I got to Stanford. So they were banned for a year. So they didn't actually get to, they go to the final four every year with us, but they didn't get to come my freshman year because they had a one year ban. Um, and then it, they also like they just accept anyone into it like if i wanted to, if i was like hey can i play an instrument like for this basketball game they're like yeah sure like hop in right. but the biggest thing they do is they do they'll do band run so like and some people will run along with them and they play all around campus and then our tree it's like a huge it's a huge deal to be the stanford tree and like you have to be next level energy to be a Stanford tree and like it's a huge competition people do wild stuff but they like do it's called a rollout where um, oh, wow. you just like yeah I don't know if they have it everywhere else I don't know if it's a common thing but like I like 3 or 4 a.m and unfortunately the person who was the new tree lived right like in the dorm or the building right next to mine the band played for like 30 minutes at 4 a.m scared the living shit out of me <laughs> i was like i was just like imagine being just like woken up by like a band right outside your window and then i'm just like sitting there and they're playing for like 30 minutes and i was like yay i was like cool um but yeah people were i think people people were like yelling out the windows at them i think people tried to call the cops but also like at the end of the day like it's our band like they're not going to get in trouble or like that's not that's nothing compared to what they've done before Okay. So is mayonnaise an instrument? Yes, Patrick. Or no, Patrick, mayonnaise is not an <laughs> instrument. <laughs> so you're a big SpongeBob fan too. We yes. were told we were told from a little birdie that you most you know most every episode by heart. Um, so the question that I guess we can we can wrap up on is what is your favorite SpongeBob meme? Because there's so Ooh. many of them. I really like the one of SpongeBob where he looks like the caveman. Okay. Um, where he's like, oh. yeah. And like, I always made jokes about it because my coach wanted me to like be like in my ready position at the net, like to set. She like wanted me to be like knees bent, like leaning forward, like hands ready. And like every single time I thought that I looked like SpongeBob, like the caveman SpongeBob. <laughs> and like, I would start laughing. I was like, I'm sorry. Like I'm trying to, 
I'm trying to like follow your directions, but also I just, I, I can't, like, I can't take it seriously right now. And it's my own fault. Like I'm taking full ownership, but like, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite SpongeBob episode? Fry Cook Olympics or Fry Cook Games. I think it's Fry Cook Games. For the, for the Krusty Krab. For I the always, <laughs> one of what I posted it last week, like every single time. Oh, or I like the Doodle Bob episode. I feel like I, like I always have to do it. Whenever I pick up a jab, I'll either like pick it up and I'll be like, me hoi, me noi, noi. <laughs> or, or uh, like sometimes when we do warm up throws, I'll be like, for the Krusty Krab. Or what do you mean? Like, <laughs> because you told me to. <laughs> so I think, I think this would be the best way to end it. Jenna, can you give us a victory screech as we end this? <laughs> Yo, it's like, victory screech! Is it literally silent? It's, oh! <laughs> My parents are awesome. like, what the hell is she doing what, in her room right now? <laughs> what kind of podcast is that? <laughs> <laughs> Jenna, thank you so much for stopping by and giving us uh, almost an hour of your time. We we appreciate you stopping to talk to two losers like us. We appreciate it more than you could ever know. Um, and thanks again for coming on the Miss Call podcast. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. See you, Jenna. So, yeah.